Two weeks ago, President Obama nominated Elena Kagan to succeed Justice John Paul Stevens as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Much has been written and said about this nomination during the last two weeks. Actually, there's been far too much talk about the process and too much partisanship surrounding this important matter. Let us refocus on the qualifi qualifications of this extraordinary nominee, remembering that a Supreme Court justice is there not to serve a Republican or a Democratic administration, but all 300 million Americans. When the President announced his choice back in May 10, he talked about Solicitor General Kagan's legal mind or intellect or record of achievement or temperament or fair-mindedness. No one can question the intelligence or the achievements of this woman. She's at the top of the legal profession. She's no stranger to breaking the glass ceiling. She was the first woman to be the dean of the prestigious Harvard Law School. She clerked for two leading judicial figures, Judge Abner Mikva on the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and then on the Supreme Court for one of the most extraordinary lawyers and judges in American history, Justice Thurgood Marshall. <clears throat> As an advocate, Thurgood Marshall helped change America for the better by bringing cases that challenge racial discrimination. He won an extraordinary 29 of the 32 cases he argued before the court, one of the most outstanding records of advocacy before the court including the landmark case of Brown versus Board of Education, which helped bring an end to racial segregation in education in America, a blot on our country that was finally removed by that, ca by that case. And despite his obvious legal qualifications, when Thurgood Marshall was nominated to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals by President Kennedy in 1961, his nomination was stalled by opponents in the Senate before he was eventually confirmed by a bipartisan vote of 54 to 16. Now, 40 years later, it's Elena Kagan who is serving as the Solicitor General of the United States, the first woman in America's history to serve as, as Solicitor General. Now, I've long urged presidents from both political parties to look outside what I've called the judicial monastery and not to feel restricted to considering only federal appellate judges as potential Supreme Court nominees. When confirmed, Elena Kagan will be the only member of the Supreme Court who did not serve as a federal appeals court judge. And when the president introduced Elena Kagan to the country, I was interested in him talking about her learning from Justice Marshall that behind laws there are stories Stories of people's lives are shaped by the law. Stories of people's lives that might be changed by the law. The president said that her understanding of law is not merely intellectual or ideological, but how it affects the lives of people. We heard Solicitor General Kagan earlier this month talk about the importance of upholding the rule of law, enabling all Americans to get a fair hearing. Now, she has broken these glass ceilings when she was appointed as first woman to serve as Solicitor General, as she did when she was named the first woman to serve as Dean of the Harvard Law School. And there are historic accomplishments. In fact, as Dean, Elena Kagan worked well with all ideological components of the faculty at Harvard. She took action to bring more conservative viewpoints to the institution. She encouraged civil discourse. Those are skills that are going to be useful in what often appears to be a sharply divided Supreme Court. Having counseled the president look outside the judicial monastery, and incidentally, Mr. President, I've made that recommendation to every president since I've been here, beginning with President Ford, and uh, I was glad the one president actually did that. I was struck that the first wave of attacks by Senate Republicans of this nomination was that she lacked judicial experience, including by some who had praised President Bush, Bush's nomination of Harriet Myers, praising her for being someone who had not served as a judge, calling her a wonderful choice who would fill very important 
gaps in the Supreme Court. Of course, now the Democratic president is, is nominating, they reverse themselves. And what was a great idea with a Republican president is now a terrible idea with a Democratic president. And they say that lack of judicial experience is a matter for concern, it's troubling, it's a matter that warrants great scrutiny. I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson who once said that a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Well, they're not suffering hobgoblins. But I would say the Republicans should not apply a double standard to the nomination of this qualified woman. This feigned criticism of her as somehow unqualified because she lacks judicial experience is also ignorant of our history and our constitutional government. It's very recently that the path of the Supreme Court became so narrow. Indeed, nearly half of our Supreme Court justices were nominated to the court from a position other than a judgeship. Let me just mention a few of the distinguished, distinguished judge, justices without prior judicial experience. Chief Justice John Marshall, Justice Louis Brandeis, Justice Felix Frankfurter, Justice Byron White, Justice Robert Jackson, and Justice William Rehnquist. Of course, Senate Republicans did not voice any such concern before the American people elected President Obama. They certainly had no such concern when President Bush was making those nominations. Nor did Senate Republicans express any concern when President Bush made other nominations to the federal courts from his close advisors and his team. Now, unlike these Republican critics, I've always championed judicial independence. I think it's important that judicial nominees understand as judges, they are not members of an administration, but they're judicial officers. They should not be political partisans, but judges uphold the Constitution and the rule of law for all Americans. Now, I welcome questions to the Solicitor General about judicial independence, but let's be fair. Let's listen to her answers. Let's set this overheated rhetoric aside. Let's be fair to Solicitor General Kagan, fair to a distinguished record. There's no basis to question her integrity, no reason to presume she will not be independent, and before someone questions the independence of this nominee, they should have a basis. I know of none. No one should presume that this intelligent woman who has excelled during every part of her varied and distinguished career lacks independence. I know of no basis for such contention. And I look forward to the beginning of the Judiciary Committee. And I, you know, if we're going to talk about inconsistencies, I was amazed, flabbergasted, to hear concerns about the schedule I set for her nomination. I tried to set the same schedule as that for Justice Roberts during the Bush administration and Justice Sotomayor during the Obama administration. But I have to admit, I didn't hit it exactly. We're taking a day longer for Elena Kagan than for John Roberts, for Sonia Sotomayor. To do it exactly in the same day, we'd have to start on Sunday, and I didn't think that would be fair, so we're adding a day in. We're starting on Monday. And I'll only note, Mr. President, that when a Republican president nominated a man to the Supreme Court, the schedule was fine. When a Democratic president nominated women to the Supreme Court in exactly the same schedule, suddenly it's not a fair schedule. Well, maybe I'm old fashioned. Maybe I'm influenced by my wife, my daughter, my three granddaughters. But I think the rules ought to be the same for men and for women. And so that's why her schedule is the same. 
save that pesky Sunday, which means it'll take a day longer than John Roberts. But we got as close as we could. And let's stop the crocodile tears on the other sides about schedules. They didn't complain when it was a Republican man being nominated for that schedule. Don't complain when a Democratic president nominates a woman and it's the same schedule. So I look forward to these hearings. That's when Solicitor General Kagan will finally be given the opportunity to answer questions and will, based on all I know about it, give the American people and open-minded and open senators confidence in their legal knowledge and abilities.